Words of Joy and Hope. It's the fifth Sunday of Ordinary Time. Year B. Mark 1, 29, 39. The comments are from Father Fernando Armelini. On leaving uh, the synagogue, Jesus entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. A good Sunday for everyone. Last week, the Gospel told us about the first steps of this small group that had begun to form to follow Jesus, the Lamb, shown by the Baptist. On Saturday, this group has participated in the liturgy that has been held in the synagogue, and we have seen that the word of Jesus has immediately produced extraordinary effect. He has cast out the unclean spirits of a man who was possessed by these forces that dehumanized him. The man had begun to scream, but it was not he who screamed, shouted, it were these negative forces that dominated him. We are at the beginning of the life, uh, public life of Jesus, and we will see what happens when we listen to this prodigious word of the teacher. The Saturday liturgy ends, and the four disciples, together with Jesus, go to the house of Peter, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning. This was the hour when the liturgy of the synagogue was finished, and the group goes home because it is time for lunch. <coughs> the family met, and it was customary to invite a friend to continue the talk about the word of God that had been heard and commented on in the synagogue. This is the context where it happens, the episode that we will examine later. <clears throat> what we will hear in the Gospel text of today. But before listening to the Gospel text, let us observe once again, take a look at, uh, at Capernaum, because it is in this city that uh, where Jesus' public life will unfold. And therefore, if we keep well present this, where this place was, we will better understand what the Gospel tells us about episodes that have taken place in that play, town. In the background, you can see the city of Capernaum. The red ribbon indicates the property of the Franciscans. Uh, what did the Franciscans do? Towards the end of the 1800, they brought, bought this piece of land, as their archaeologists have guessed, that the house where Jesus had lived during his public life could be there. They looked for the house, excavated around uh, the 1900s, the famous Gaudencio Orfali, great archaeologist, a Franciscan archaeologist, then in the 60s, Ofreda Virgilio Corvo, found the house where Jesus had lived. There you have it. You can see it under the dark dome of the church that uh, was built precisely to protect the place where Peter's house was. You can also see in the synagogue that is not the time of Jesus. Uh, the one from the time of Jesus was at the base of that construction that was made on the fourth century, and, and now uh, you see the ruins. This part of Capernaum was the center of the city. It will also indicate a rather curious place. They are the shops of the city of Capernaum in the time of Jesus. They are in indicated that people walked barefooted. Also Jesus uh, walked barefooted. 
But if uh, someone ever wanted to give a gift of sandals, they could certainly buy them there. Even Jesus also entered into those shops. Note also that all constructions are made with a dark basalt stone. I will also indicate some places along this lake which are mentioned in the Gospel. <clears throat> in the background, you can see where Tiberias was. Herod and Tipas lived there with Herodias. The Gospels do not say if Jesus went to the city, although Herod wanted to see him. <clears throat> to get to Tiberias from Capernaum, one hour and 15 minutes of boat were needed, but Jesus never went there. It was an impure city built on a cemetery, but Herod Antipas had it as his, as his capital. I also indicate another very important city, Magdala. You can see it in the background. This was the most important city of the lake. There the fish uh, were salted, the salted fish, the dry fish. If you look at the lake, you can imagine that during the night, the disciples, Peter, Andrew, ja James, and John, the Zebedee, were fishing in the lake during the night, and then they would take the fish to sell it in Magdala. This was the work of these disciples, who will then follow the Lamb. Another important place that is good to mention is the port of Capernaum. After uh, fishing during the night, they took the fish to Magdala, they sold them there, and they returned mooring in that port that is indicated, and that is about 200 meters from the house of Peter. There they left their boats, and it is in this port where Jesus has met the first disciples and called them. Now, uh, let's pay attention to that dome. Peter's house was there, under that dome. How did they discover this place? It was very simple. With the first excavation they did, they discovered the foundation of an octagonal church. The archaeologists immediately understood that it was a Byzantine church. If they had built it there, it meant that below was a venerated place. In fact, they excavated in the center of this octagonal church and found a place that was certainly the place where Jesus lived. How did they know? The Byzantine architects did not destroy those houses that were underneath. Not only have they respected them, but they have reinforced those walls. It means that they wanted to protect them. They were sacred. And they built their church on top of them. This is something very interesting because based on those foundations, the archaeologists could rebuild Peter's house to reconstruct. It was to reconstruct to rebuild the house of Peter. It was the extended family of Peter because there were also Andrew with his family who lived together in that place. Let us see the reconstruction that will help us understand many other things of the Gospels. You can observe, see that as in all the blocks, there is a patio of 84 square meters in the open sky. And there the main activity of the family took place. The oven and the, the mortar, the dishes, different uh, glasses that have been found there. And all the activities took place there. The one who washed was there, the one who shelled the wheat did it there. And uh, it were the women who did this work. Then there were the constructions of this place. There was a room that was the largest. 
the central one, eight by eight meters. This place later was transformed into the meeting place of the first Christian community. Why do we know this with certainty? In the interior, it was found, and there are three level layers, each time with richer and more beautiful decorations. And observing this environment, they have found 175 inscriptions, graffiti left by pilgrims who came from all over the world to visit this house. How do we know that they were coming from everywhere? Because there were inscriptions in Greek, in Syrian, therefore they came from Syria, from Damascus, inscriptions in Aramaic, and also in Latin. It means that pilgrims from Rome came to visit this place too. Then you can notice that uh, there is a gateway to this place. <clears throat> it is the door we will hear about in today's Gospels text. Then next to the door there is a shelter where people could meet. If we keep these explanations in mind, we will understand better the evangelical text of today that we will soon hear. And also other episodes that we will hear throughout the year when reading the text of the Gospel of Mark. Simon's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. They immediately told him about her. He approached, grasped her hand, and helped her up. Then the fever left her, and she waited on them. What we have just heard is the briefest account of the healing of the gospel. And being the first, we would expect a more spectacular miracle. But Marx tells it in a very simple way about this healing of Peter's uh, mother-in-law. Uh, Mark was not, has not written it to arouse our admiration. He has written it to express the meaning of the gesture made by Jesus. To say that the Master's word produces when it reaches a certain place. Now let us examine all the details of this uh, narrative. Mark who wrote this episode 35 years later, even without having been present there, points out to details that seem superfluous. It would have been enough to say that Jesus had cured Peter's mother-in-law, but instead he described this episode almost painstakingly. The reason is that all these details have a catechetical meaning, and we must discover the message that he wants to communicate. First of all, who is the sick person? She is a woman. What does this woman represent? Certainly, Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law. But under what conditions is this woman? And what does she represent? The situation of this woman represents the condition of the humanity that Jesus finds. In what condition is it? It's on bed. The one who is in bed is blocked, cannot do anything, cannot work, cannot move. He or she is of no use. On the contrary, they are a burden for others. They do not help themselves. They are helpless. And what person is this? What humanity is this? It is not the fullness of life, because the person who is in fullness of life is one who creates, who builds, who does things. This woman is paralyzed. The Creator has given a person, man, us, the created things, the capacity to look 
for his goal, to make his design on the world. But the one who does not work is sick, he or she is no longer a creator, but is one who only consumes. I am speaking symbolically, of course, not about a sick person. And in the symbolism of the evangelist Mark, this woman is presented with a symbol of a humanity who does not live, that does not build. She's blocked. What is blocking her? Fever. We do not know what disease, disease it is, but there is a fever in this woman preventing her from fully fulfilling her life. It is a fever that prevents her from serving, from being useful to others. This fever is the image of the evil that immobilizes the person, that dehumanizes him because it blocks in him the capacity to love, the ability to serve the brothers and sisters. This fever has a name. This force that prevents doing something useful for others, it is the relegation on oneself, selfishness, relegation on one's own interest, our own affairs. And it is this fever that dehumanizes people and that also dehumanizes humanity because if one blocks the ability to love, he or she is not a person because that what characterizes the person, unlike the pre-human, is the attention to others, the service to others, and love. These are these fevers that block the ability to be a complete person. Let us see now the healing of this fever, how it happens. First of all, they immediately tell Jesus about this disease. It is necessary, necessary to see, to examine the disease together with him. Uh, let us give some examples to better understand this point. One of the fevers we know that blocks the person is the frenzy of power. They are the ones who want to dominate. This fever leads to corruption, to deceit, to satisfy this fever, to prevail over others, to make use of others. It is a fever that dehumanizes. Incidentally, in the room that I have indicated to you, the one eight by eight where Jesus lived, one day, Jesus meets with his disciples. The evangelist uh, Mark tells this in chapter 9. On the way, the disciples were succumbing to this fever, the fever of dominion, of power, of prevailing over others. Jesus has heard them discussing, and when they arrive at this place, Jesus sits down and asks them, what were you talking about along the way? They were silent because they are ashamed to recognize the fever that incited them to compete with each other. Jesus is going to cure that fever of the disciples. He takes a child, embraces him, and he will say, they should be willing to serve the last, not to be dominators, but servants. This is the word that cures this fever. Another fever, the attachment to money. We all know it. This, what does this fever produce? It blocks the human in people because it leads them to exploit. A fever that ruins even family harmony because, for example, when dividing an inheritance, if they let themselves be carried away by this fever, the brotherhood, the fellowship is destroyed. It leads to committing injustice, robbery, and even crimes. It is the word of Christ that overcomes, that casts out this fever and makes the human appear in people. Humanity is not human if it is dominated by this fever. Let us think of another fever, the one of the uncontrolled passions that takes people to intemperance and even to commit perversions. These fevers must be presented to Christ 
because he recognizes them and shows the cure of these fevers. If we do not present them to him, we resort to remedies that instead of healing, worsen the disease. Let us now observe the gestures Jesus uses. They are all very significant. Uh, they are very simple, but uh, they are a lesson for the community. What does Jesus do? He approaches. He does not move away. He is not afraid. He does not start to imprecate the disease. It is what we do many times. Instead of healing it with that word, we limit ourselves to imprecate against the evils of the world. And Jesus does not do that. He's coming. It is humanity. This is their condition. And his intervention is needed to cure this fever. Jesus does not stand aside from our evil because he has come to start a new humanity. And this is the new humanity that he finds. We must be careful not to lament over the humanity that Jesus loved. And this and that he wanted to transform and humanize. Notice that it is not our goodness that attracts Jesus, but our need. He wants us happy. He wants to save us from all our fevers that make us incapable of being people. That is, to be at the service of the brothers and sisters. Second detail. After he approached the problem, he extended his hand. It is important the verb that is used here, egeirein, which means to resurface. What Jesus found was a dead humanity because humanity did not know how to love. It was possessed of fever. Then Jesus makes her lift up. This detail, the taking of the hand, it means communion with his person, to contact with his person. It means to be accompanied by him. He lifts her from the bed of laziness, of weakness, of the inability to serve. It is necessary that we allow ourselves to be taken by Jesus' hand. The hand means our activity. We must put our hands next to his. Let our works, our actions, be accompanied by him so that they become truly human. What is it that paralyzes the child of God who is in us? It is the relegation on ourselves, the inability to serve. This is the healing. The fever left her and she began to serve them. Not to serve him, but serve them transforming her into a servant. Uh, naturally, it's not a reference for women to be the ones to serve. No, it is the sick humanity that wants to heal herself when it does not dominate, when it does not want to be served by others, but when it becomes a servant. Only then it will be a real humanity. We remember what the ideal of the Greek man was, the dominator, not the server. Jesus came to save us from that inhuman ideal. One is healthy when one stands up to serve. So this word that has come to this house, that produced this change, that has made a human life resurfaces, now this word comes out of the private house and from the door takes care of the sick humanity. It is the humanity that presents Jesus with his illness. It is only this word that can give fullness of life. When it was evening, after sunset, 
they found, they brought to Jesus all who were ill or possessed by demons. The whole town was gathered at the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases. And he drove out many demons, not permitting them to speak because they knew him. <coughs> During uh, Saturday, people respected the norm that forbade moving, carrying weight, healing the sick. <clears throat> but at dusk, therefore, in the evening of the new day, they all begin to move and bring their sick to Jesus. <clears throat> and they place them in front of the door. I have indicated previously where this door was in front of that room of uh, 84 square meters was the door that faced the street and then took to the synagogue. <coughs> okay, people gather in front of the door. They know that inside that house there is a word that is prodigious and therefore they hope that from that door will come the word that heals all the fevers of humanity. <coughs> It is the image of the reality of our church. From the house of Peter, which represents the Christian community, I already said in the presentation that it was precisely in that house where the community met. It is the image of humanity that comes so that from that door will come the word of the teacher, capable of curing the fevers that dehumanized our world. They take the sick. It is humanity that presents its own condition to the word of the gospel. They bring the sick. Except from the lepers and the woman who had lost of blood, who went alone, all others do not go to Jesus alone. It is necessary that someone accompany them, someone who realizes that these people are not living a full life. There is something that has blocked them. A brother or a sister who realizes the situation of illness, take these people and accompany them to the one who can cure them. And here we note that it is, there are those who have understood the strength of this word, the ones who accompany the sick to bring them in front of that door. The whole population is in front of that door. Today's uh, cities uh, do not seek healing, but just uh, to produce, to make fun. Who can make them? We have to make the experience of how to convert the word of the gospel into a full person. They should become aware, make them people understand that they should go to meet Jesus. Saturday is over. Everyone goes to rest. Let us hear what happens the day after. <clears throat> Rising very early before dawn, he left and went off to a deserted place where he prayed. Simon and those who were with him pursued him and on finding him said, Everyone is looking for you. He told them, let us go to the nearby villages that I may preach there also. For this purpose have I come. So he went into their synagogues, preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. Saturday is over and at dawn, Jesus gets up early. We know that the night is for sleeping. When we fall asleep, uh, we are not in touch with rumors, uh, with people. Jesus is now in solitude, facing the Creator. 
silence leads us to face the essential, the deep questions of our life, with what counts, with the true meaning of our existence. Now, some are afraid of these moments because they lead a consumeristic life. That is, they spend their time trying to obtain the maximum of pleasure of uh, satisfaction. They do not worry about uh, building something that remains, something that really makes sense in their lives. And we find Jesus, who shows us the true man, the true person begins his or her journey by standing in, in presence with the Father to discover the project that the Father of Heaven has on his or her life. This is prayer. Jesus gets up in the morning, and the first thing he does is not to start doing things. It is to be with the Father because with his light, he wants to see the path that he should follow that day. And this is the man, Jesus. And Peter uh, sees that this man, uh, well, he sees it in a different way. Peter looks for the successful man. And when in the morning, he probably finds people in front of the door, people gathered there. He looks for Jesus and he goes and search for the teacher. He searches for Jesus. The Greek verb is interesting, kata dioko, which means to go and look for. Peter wants to take Jesus to his project, take Jesus after success. This is the first misunderstanding of Jesus who wants to realize to make his own dream and use Jesus to achieve this goal. He goes in search of Jesus and finds him and he says, everyone is looking for you. Jesus answered, let us go from here to the neighboring towns so that I can preach there. It is for this that I have left Capernaum. There, the word has shown its effectiveness. Now we must go to all the other peoples to show this word. So they may, the new humanity there can begin to. And the gospel text concludes by saying that Jesus went to the whole Galilee preaching in the synagogues to expel all the demons that prevent the person from his of her own fulfillment. I wish everyone a good Sunday and a good week.